Okay, so today um, we're very happy to have Daniel Reeves from the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Uh, he's an associate in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division um, in Seattle, where he studies viral and immune system dynamics. And he's particularly focused on using models to design mechanistically motivated preventions and cures for viral infections. And I'm really excited to have Dan, who I met, I don't know, it must have been what, four or five years ago now, Dan? And we've been talking periodically about let's let's uh, have invite each other to give talks. So I'm really excited to hear about um, his work on the latent HIV reservoir. And as usual, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I'll uh, get to them at the end. Or if there's um, uh, if Dan's okay, you know, we can I'll signal that there's uh, a question as well. Thanks. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me. Um, and I wish I could be there in person. Of course, I love Montreal. Um, a bunch of my family is there actually, and it's always such a nice place to visit. So um, I will give a introduction to uh, some HIV stuff because I'm not sure exactly what everyone's background is here. And then we'll, we'll talk about uh, several different models that are building towards what I'm thinking of as this unified model that, that merges phylogenetics and viral dynamics uh, to, uh, to think more deeply about the, the kinds of data that we get in HIV, which a lot of the time is, is sequencing data. Okay, so I start um, with my acknowledgements here. Um, so the, the group I'm in is led by Josh Schiffer, who's in the center there, and it's this really fun group of, of uh, clinicians and uh, modelers that come from engineering and physics and applied math and so forth. So it's really fun group to be uh, a part of. And several collaborators around the country here in, in, in Australia have contributed to, to this work. So my motivation for the work, uh, you know, in, in the last year, uh, there was a second reported cure and uh, or, or still remains to be seen if it's a cure, it's never fully known, but um, where there's this procedure where, where individuals got stem cell transplants and that ended up with someone who got off their medication and had no more HIV. So this really motivating thing. And I was at this, this talk at the, the retrovirus conference where there was all these reporters and it was this really motivating event, I think as, as anything like this might be. So, but of course, and also uh, in the more recent past, um, the influence I think of HIV research has been really important to think about COVID-19. And so um, I, I, I stole this little timeline uh, from a, a Twitter feed here, but there's this really amazing correspondence between the rate at which uh, advancements in HIV and advancements in SARS-CoV-2 have occurred where first observations of AIDS in the 80s and then identifying the virus itself, HIV, identifying the, the cells it attacks and then starting to sequence it and then come up with a drug. So this is like a 15 year timeline leading up to a combination antiretroviral therapy, which is the, the current standard of care for HIV and, and basically suppresses it in anyone who can uh, continue to take the, the drugs. Um, Whereas for SARS-CoV-2, first observations last December goes through sequencing within months, uh, single month even, and then measuring viral loads and identifying the receptor and then drugs and now vaccines. So that you take this 15 year HIV timeline and squash it into like five, 10 months of, of research. It's of absolutely mind blowing. And I think uh, it's, it's been really, it's inspirational to see that happening. Uh, the other thing that's happening for SARS-CoV-2 is that people are really getting into using viral phylodynamics to understand epidemiology. And this is a field that's been uh, working for a while, but I think this came to the forefront, you know, and you have people asking you about sequencing and transmission dynamics just in the lay audience. That's how, that's how prevalent this has become. So I think I'm, I'm just thinking about the impact of phylodynamics on an epidemiologic level, and then thinking about how this might be applied at a within host level is, is logical. So in, inspired by that as well. I think a final thing I would add here is that like HIV, SARS-CoV-2 is really attacking marginalized populations and 
this is a motivation personally for me is, is it's really powerful to work for these populations and, and be doing research that's affecting uh, the country in, in a not symmetric way. So I, I, I would add that to the list of, of important things that, that matter to me in this kind of work. So the last few years I've been thinking about HIV and I think we really do still need a cure. Um, this is a lot of the world is not able to take medication every day like is required uh, in the standard of care in America. And, and this would really reduce the burden, of, uh, especially in, in, some, uh, in some countries in Africa and, and uh, in Southeast Asia. So the HIV reservoir is the largest barrier to the cure. So uh, in this talk and in the last few years, I'll, I'll address several questions. I'm not sure exactly who is, is on this call, but hopefully this is enough uh, detail and also not too much for some of you. Uh, so what is the HIV reservoir? Why does it persist? How might we remove it? When is it created? And then try to stitch that together at the end uh, to show you this, this pathway that's now taken me to this unified model. So very quickly, the life cycle of HIV works like this. There is HIV virions that infect cells. They infect CD4 positive T cells. This is the helper cells of the immune system. And so this is the viral entry requires that receptor. The uh, RNA is reverse transcribed to DNA and often there's mutations when that happens. So then the, the DNA is integrated into the cell's DNA. And then that can go on and, and make more virions using the cell's machinery. Um, but also it can do this other step where uh, somehow the cells become inactivated. And this is currently still a really intense interest for, for a lot of people is what's actually happening here. And so they can enter a latent state where there's HIV provirus in the host DNA, but then these cells appear to live like normal uh, T cells. So what happens uh, through this life cycle in primary infection is that you get this repeatable viral load dynamics. So in the days since the first positive test, this is beautiful data from a, a New England Journal of Medicine paper. Uh, that shows peak viral loads and then uh, sort of drop down from that and then reaching a viral load set point. And so you get this easy trajectory that's, that's really well fit for, for mathematical modeling. Meanwhile, there is really repeatable viral evolution. So the, this is a phylogenetic tree. I mean, I, I'm sure many of you, most of you have seen a phylogenetic tree, but just also very quickly, what this is showing you is if every one of these dots is a sequence from somebody who's had HIV for years, if you look at where the dots align, oh, sorry, and any, any two lines here tell you how far away in sequence space the dots are. So the key is that there's no X or there's no Y axis. It's all about the X axis here. So you take a dot, you look at the other dot, you can measure going back to their common ancestor, how far apart they are in sequence space. And importantly, then if you also color them by when they were sampled, what you see is that early in an HIV infection, most of the dots are black, there's some purple, and then later it goes through this sort of rainbow color scheme. But the, the key thing is that over time, the sequence diverges. And at most time points, the sequences that are around are most related to the other sequences that are around at that time point, as opposed to any other sequence in time. So there's this constant uh, evolutionary process that occurs while you have this viral dynamics occurring. When antiretroviral therapy is introduced, the key is that it blocks all of these mechanisms. And the, and the combination uh, antiretroviral therapy is amazing in the sense that it blocks several of these steps. But what's left over are these latently infected cells. And, and that's what I'll, I'll talk about now for a little bit. So in... In the same time, you have viral load dynamics that are very repeatable as well. And, and so we're interested in this part, the HIV reservoir in which the viral load decays and then it's undetectable. Unfortunately, when people stop antiretroviral therapy, the viral load comes back, hence why we need the cure. So this, this, this period here, undetectable viral load is, is what the, the focus of this talk is on. What's been observed in the past is that 
Meanwhile, if you can do even better measurements on what's happening while undetectable, the viral load decays repeated, or the, the, sorry, the latent reservoir decays. So there is a really slow half-life. It takes three to four years per half-life. And so therefore natural cure would take 70 plus years. This is um, studies from the early 2000s and, and repeated nicely in 2015 show this. So it's a roughly exponential decay. And, and this is actually where my dive into modeling the reservoir began was just with a simple exponential decay model of the latent reservoir. To go a little farther into what is sustaining the reservoir, so get a little more mechanistic, we, we thought about a few possibilities for what could be sustaining the reservoir and then, and then sought to sort of rule them out. So that it's possible that there's viral replication even though you can't see it with, with normal tests. So there, uh, it, it's possible that viruses are still infecting new cells, maybe in some site where there's not enough drug. And if that's true, you will get things happening where you see viral production, new infection, and therefore you see mutated sequences. And also you can measure this by where the sequence is integrated into the host genome. That's another surrogate for a, a sort of mutation or new infection is it's very rare by chance that HIV would integrate into exactly the same place in the host genome when it infects a new cell as, as another one. Um, and it's also possible these latently infected cells are just living for a long time. So T cells do have long half-lives naturally. And if so, what you would see is you, the same integration sites, the same HIV sequences just staying static over time. And then furthermore, T cells do, do natural immune things. So they proliferate, they die and, and so forth. And to see what's happening with them, you would look for equivalent integration sites. So this is now HIV integrated into the same place in multiple cells or equivalent HIV sequences, slightly less good evidence, but most importantly, you'll see clonal populations. And when you actually go look at a tree from an HIV reservoir individual, the first thing you'll see is that there's fewer sequences. It's really hard experiments to do, but the key here is that you see both of the things that I was talking about. You see identical sequence clones. So these are repeated uh, HIV sequences that are found in multiple HIV infected cells. The chance of that happening by HIV replication is really rare because it mutates so much. However, you also see singles. So you see unique sequences and there's uh, so, so a little bit of conflict as to, this doesn't immediately tell you which mechanism is, is driving this. I, I call this analyzing the HIV reservoir ecology. Uh, and, and just to be clear, this is in comparison to the active iremia case where you have this obvious divergence and, and no clones. What we then realized is that, of course, the sampling of this matters a ton. So if you actually just only sample a tiny tip of the iceberg of the HIV reservoir, you're still very likely to find singletons that are just by chance found once. So, you know, if you, the observations are less than a thousand cells, the entire reservoir might be millions of cells, billions of cells. And therefore, what we did is made a model of the distribution of clone sizes. So, you know, there, maybe there's lots of different clone sizes with intermediate down to small ones, and they have some sort of uh, abundance distribution. But when you sample from that, you get this discretized version of that and you get tons of singles. But of course, they, they may be from actually from larger clones just sampled by chance. Couple uh, interesting findings from, from that analysis that are maybe a little bit more interesting to modelers are that the rank abundance curve is, is approximately power law distributed. So these are distributions that you find all over the place. And um, I, I say approximately because we could try lots of different models that would, that would look somewhat like this, but to keep it simple, we just use a, a, a power law uh, abundance curve and extrapolate these curves. So this is from eight different humans and multiple time points in each human. This is a rank abundance curve. So this is the clones ranked from biggest to, to, to smallest and, and their abundance on the y-axis. And when you extrapolate, you see that the biggest clones are actually really, really massive. They could have themselves millions or billions of cells associated with them. And this, to be fair, I, I would say is a very conservative model because we chose the maximum richness that is possible in, in the HIV reservoir. So these 
theoretically, these curves could stop even earlier. They don't have to go out as far in rank. We, we can't make predictions about the, the total ranks. But so therefore, we chose a conservative model that has a, as much diversity as possible. And what you find from this is that if you just look at the area under the curve, most of these cells, huge majority originate from cellular proliferation, i.e. our clones, uh, as opposed to the, the true singles rather than the observed singles. And then this, this finding that the largest clone sizes really are one to maybe 100 million associated infected cells, if, if you extrapolate this model, requires 20 to 25 cell divisions. So this is not homeostatic cell division. This is, has to be uh, in, in response to some sort of antigenic field. So uh, a large expansion, and, and I would predict now that that, that means that the largest clones would be oscillating. So you wouldn't necessarily find the same clone, the biggest all the time, if it really is this antigenic uh, response. So summary from that section, the replication competent HIV reservoir in the blood is predominantly clonal and therefore implicates cellular proliferation as the majority source of HIV infected cells. Uh, and the clone abundances are approximately power law distributed. So there's a massive number of small clones and a small number of massive clones. And what's nice is that this, uh, just this year, these findings are now consistent in, in lymph nodes. So this is all, what I showed is all sequencing from the blood, but uh, a lot of, there was a lot of uh, consideration put into as well, the anatomy of this. So other people have checked and, and it's roughly consistent, which is really nice. So you, you get this picture where originally you have clones measured. And then in this picture, all the gray were singletons. And what I'm suggesting is really, it should look more like this continuous spectrum where, where there's lots of, uh, of clones throughout the size. Another fun finding here is that if you look at the power law distribution, which has been done before in natural human T cells, it's about the same. So this is a graph from uh, this uh, Mora and Walchek uh, paper from a few years ago now, which is showing that the rank abundance curve is also about a power law slope of one. So it suggests that the HIV clones and the, and the T cells naturally are, have the same sort of mechanisms driving them. And so I call this the, the passenger hypothesis, which is the idea that the reason HIV has this rank abundance curve is because it infects human T cells. And then these human T cells have this uh, mechanism of expansion and contraction that leads to approximately power law. And so HIV just sort of rides along and in, in, uh, has this power law distribution too. A next thing I might say here is that, uh, and this is something actually, you know, science is funny in this way, but we, we sort of got to this first and then came back around to the science. But the, the cure propo proposal here is that if HIV is a passenger on the T cell dynamics, perhaps you should target the vehicle. So in, we, we have suggested using anti-proliferative therapy. This is really uh, an original suggestion from Josh Schiffer and Florian Fladik, um, which is to use T cell anti-proliferative medications to stop the, the proliferation of T cells and therefore maybe reduce reservoir size. We, uh, we actually got funding to do a study on, on humans because the, they're already licensed drugs and they're not very dangerous, like given to people with uh, autoimmune disorders all the time. So what we gave uh, this mycophenolate mofetil MMF drug to four humans for six months uh, and, and measured them three months, six months, and, and a year. And this was just a small study, but in Unfortunately, in none of these people was there an obvious decrease in the HIV reservoir size. So there's still some really fun next questions about that. Like perhaps if you block T cell proliferation, do they actually have a sort of compensatory immune mechanism where then they die less? Or was it just not enough drug and that's why you don't see an effect on the reservoir? Uh, so, so fun investigations here. This was just presented by, by Josh last year at, at Croy. So we'll, we'll see where this goes. Another finding from the, the last year is that this rank abundance ecology analysis got some other people interested. And in, in, uh, I, I started this collaboration up with Annie Antar, who's at Hopkins. And uh, so what she found is in five individuals, she looked at two different time points, which are both long after starting antiretroviral therapy, which is great. So the first time point about two years after antiretroviral therapy, the second one about seven years. 
and looked, we looked at together at the, the sort of reservoir ecology over time in humans taking antiretroviral therapy. And so the first time point here, you see a rank abundance curve. I'll also point out that this is what these really undersampled rank abundance curves look like. So they're, it's hard to pull out uh, a confident estimate of this, but the data were so um, clearly showing this that we were, we were confident in this, that the, the rank abundances on early time points are a lot flatter. And then over time they get steeper. So if you look at the, the power law exponent here, it, it had a, a, an obvious increase over time in these five people. The key then, or the, the key interpretation here then is that because HIV is not getting more diverse over time, while the T cell receptor, uh, let's say that sequencing experiments can lead to the same rank abundance curve over time, that's partially because the T cells get new diversity from thymic uh, immigrants and, and new cells that are created to fight new pathogens. But HIV is just sort of a marker on those cells and, and it's not getting new diversity. So it's possible to imagine that over time, some of the big clones are getting bigger and some of the small clones are getting removed from the system. So therefore you get this steepening of the rank abundance curve where the, the diversity is, is lessening. And a really initial model I took at, at doing sort of genetic diversity in the reservoir over time was actually for a, a project with Pavitra, who's a colleague of mine at the, the Fred Hutch. And she's done some, I just highlight this because she's done some unbelievable sequencing work for SARS-CoV-2 and, you know, got written up in the New York Times. It was crazy to see. But the experiment that she was doing was a computational analysis uh, a long time ago of HIV diversity in the reservoir. And so we made this little model of, of what could be happening if you consider all of the dynamics of the, the single clones and then target them with some sort of gene therapy. So if you're interested in removing HIV selectively by some sort of gene editing, the finding unfortunately from this is that if this is the reservoir size and each of these colored lines is, is its own clone, you can re remove the clones that you can target with your therapy, but unless you have a, like a pretty much 100% broad therapy, you really only make a dent in the reservoir size by doing an experiment like this. So uh, our, our claim in that paper is basically, if you're gonna do gene therapy, it has to be extremely broad to target the, the breadth of the HIV reservoir. A lingering question from that analysis, though, got me started on a different project, which is uh, what are the initial conditions of the reservoir when antiretroviral therapy is started? So we're interested in when and how the reservoir is created. And, and that leads to, just to go back here, leads to like, what is the initial conditions if, if this is the start of antiretroviral therapy? Uh, the current dogma in the field is that it's created really early. So uh, this is a, a pretty amazing paper where they uh, went to great lengths to figure out how early. And it seems like in the first few days, the HIV reservoir is created. And therefore, if, if you can't start the therapy basically prophylactically, you're, you're destined to have some latent cells created and uh, a challenge for, for cure. I was also uh, able to sort of confirm this with a, a pretty fun meta-analysis. So Eva Shelton is, was just a, a medical student with working with my colleague, uh, Rachel Bender Ignacio. And she, she read through a lot of reservoir papers. And so we put together this, this fun figure here where um, I'll, I'll take you through it, it's pretty dense, is the x-axis is time between the estimated date of infection and ART initiation. So this is sort of how early ART was started. Each one of these dots is a, is a study and the, and the number of individuals in the study is shown as the, the size of the dots. So some of them are really big studies. And the y-axis is the reservoir size. And if you look at this graph, there's a little bit of a correlation here. So it, it, it sort of seems like the later you start ART, the bigger the reservoir is, but there's these sort of weird outliers. And uh, the key there is then if you, if you sort of color this as well by how soon after the therapy starts uh, was, was the study conducted and, and measured, you find out that these outliers are sort of in this yellow. So they're 
they're, they're humans who were, whose reservoir was measured pretty soon after they started therapy. And if you remove them, so if you take all of the studies who only measured people after about a year of therapy, you get uh, an even stronger correlation here where it's, it's pretty obvious that the, the later that you start therapy, the bigger the reservoir size is. Um, and the key thing for the experimentalist here is that if you, if you start taking measurements too early, basically the system hasn't equilibrated yet and, and you get, you measure things that aren't really the real reservoir. Uh, and then, so in terms of a model of this, uh, what we had been thinking, and I think most of the modeling papers I've read, I've read, um, assume that the reservoir creation sort of begins right away during primary infection. And that's this term here where there's, you know, the change in the reservoir size over time is, is classic viral production, but then there's a little fraction that gets put into the reservoir and that just starts right away. And then maybe the reservoir clearance begins as soon as the first cells are created. So you have basically, uh, if you take away this uh, production term, you get an exponential clearance term. And, and that's sort of the, the model. I think a lot of people would have qualitatively. And I think a lot of people have written down quantitatively. And what, what that generates is basically over time, weeks, this is a, a model from a different paper, but you get creation of the reservoir within the first weeks and it sort of saturates after, after the peak. So uh, what's fun about that is it's not quite that simple, I think. So this is a, this is a really great collaboration with uh, Dara Lehman and Mark Pankow and Julie Overbaugh's group. And they had this wonderful experiment where they have uh, six individuals and it's a little more complicated. You, you can check out the paper that they're super infected as well, so there's there's more complication there. But these are very interesting individuals who have HIV reservoir sequencing performed at different times after ART. So, and importantly, with re regard to that previous statement I just made, after a year of therapy. But they also have, before antiretroviral therapy was started, a bunch of measurements of RNA, viral RNA going back 10 or 15 years in some of these people before ART. So you can sort of compare the before ART and after ART sequences. Here's a single individual and what this looks like. This is a phylogenetic tree, of course, and again, colored by time the sample was taken. So the red samples are the ones uh, from acute HIV infection. And then the going through the color spectrum, the pink ones are sequences that are near the time of antiretroviral therapy. So this is, if you look in the HIV reservoir, you get these black dots and you say, these, what, what sequence in the HIV reservoir corresponds to a sequence found from RNA before the therapy was started? So you sort of take these black dots and, and identify sequences that are in the reservoir. And even by eye, it's pretty clear that the black dots are more likely to be in the pink sequences. So the reservoir is, is already by eye seems to be sort of skewed towards the later HIV sequences. And this is uh, an observation that's now been made several times, uh, starting with uh, Johanna Brodin in 2016, and then this really great paper from 2019 as well. I, I think the, the thing we've done a little bit extra here has gone to the trouble of modeling some of this. So uh, to study something like that, you need a model with age structure. So is it possible that the HIV reservoir creation is happening asymmetrically over time? Uh, and, and I should just say that basically you start with some model like this where there's a really low probability of joining the HIV reservoir before antiretroviral therapy and then basically zero afterwards. Um, and what this model admits is a, is a, if you take just a sort of representative viral load curve is you get a, a model that, that gives viral load over time. And then you look at what proportion of the reservoir was made in the first year, year one to two, year two to three, year three to four. And of course, with a simple model like that, it's pretty obvious, a lot of the reservoir is created right at the peak because this is logs higher than the, the set point. 
And then the rest, if, if the set point remains flat, is just you get the same amount every year uh, from, from viral seeding. Then if you allow for age structure, so meaning that the, the sequences that are around in the first year are likely to die more than the sequences that are around uh, in the year eight. So this is just saying that the older sequences are, are likely to disappear over time. This is sort of the model we would have expected. Uh, you, get, you get something like this, where you take the created biviral seeding curve. So, and then again, this is the reservoir proportion. And you look after time, the, the, purple sequ uh, the, the first year sequences have had more time to decay. So they're, they're a lot lower. And you get a little bit of a, a bias towards sequences that were created later. So assuming antiretroviral therapy was started here, you would have 20% of the reservoir made in the last year and about 15% made right at peak viremia. So this would say that the, the reservoir should be predominantly made up of sequences um, after year eight, but you still have a, a pretty meaningful contribution from the peak. Then if you go and compare to those six individuals from the, the sequencing study, it, it, clearly, it clearly shows that this model is not quite right. And it's showing that the, this is now a, a, a scale prior to ART. So each one of these bars is a, is a human sequencing study where showing this dot, 50% of the sequences in the reservoir came from this time point, 40% from this time point and so forth. And the models compare to that. And so the model really underestimates the fraction that is around, that was created right before antiretroviral therapy initiated. So it's, it's overestimating the, the contribution from peak viremia and underestimating the contribution contemporaneous to ART. Uh, and to, to sort of plot this now, if you actually look at the, the half-life of those uh, measurements, you can fit an exponential model to those. It's, it's not great, but it actually works pretty well. And you can, you can see that the, the half-life of those sort of sequence disappearances is a lot faster than the estimates of the half-life of the population decay. And so I would say that you have to make the clearance rate depend on, uh, on explicitly on time. And importantly, just you could do it as this discrete thing where after antiretroviral therapy starts, the decay rate's slower. So that's, that's a sort of unfortunate finding for trying to get rid of the reservoir that it appears it's cleared faster during primary infection than it is once uh, the virus is suppressed. There's a bunch of mechanistic hypotheses for why this could be happening. And, and so I haven't, uh, I, I would need more data to actually choose between them, but you can think about if you go back to this picture, there's, is it possible that right at the start of ART, there's more seeding. This would be pretty paradoxical if, if actually giving the drugs drives latency. So that's this arrow going from uh, to the latently infected state. You can imagine something like that where ART sort of shuts down the viral replication. It makes the immune system a little bit less active and therefore cells transition. Similarly, it's also possible that maybe there's less reactivation during ART. Uh, so meaning that perhaps because when there's a ton of viral replication going on, the T cells are reactivating all the time, it's, it's more likely that a latent cell gets reactivated and, and sort of gets destroyed that way. Uh, it's also possible that maybe there's just more death during chronic infection. Or, so again, if there's a lot of virus around, maybe the, the latently infected cells that, that wouldn't normally get killed, they're just sort of bystanders and get destroyed. And then also possibly to go to the cellular proliferation story that we, we push as well. Is it possible that one ART is initiated, there's a sort of influx of new cells because the virus isn't killing the CD4 T cells and to get, regain homeostasis, maybe you should see a boost in sequences because of that. So fun future studies to try to figure out exactly why that, that is occurring. One more thing about this passenger hypothesis that is sort of suggested by that is that maybe the T cell dynamics before antiretroviral therapy are initiated also matter. So this is a paper that's uh, on MedArchive from Florencia Boscher, who's now at University College London, but was a really fun postdoc companion for me. And uh, her story is about proliferation of CD4 T cells during primary infection. So it's, they're, 
there's no reason to believe that the cells aren't also proliferating to fight HIV right, uh, right when the peak is happening. And so her, her modeling here suggests that the, basically when there's a peak uh, in the viral load, so uh, just a simple model like this, this is accompanied by a, a big drop in the number of susceptible uh, infected, infectable CD4 T cells. And then they regrow and sort of this accompanies this like peak viremia and then viral load set point. So peak and then set point is accompanied by in susceptible cells, a, a drop and then their own set point. But as they regrow here, if they're HIV infected, they would create clones even in that moment. So again, if, if the, the cells are replicating, they, they faithfully copy the, the virus DNA instead of mutating it and you get clones. So her prediction is that you would see clones really early on HIV in HIV infected, uh, infection. And uh, interestingly, in the same year now, uh, an experimental paper just came out that says clones of infected cells arise in uh, early in HIV infected individuals. We, of course, we would have liked to have had our paper published before this. That would have been more fun. But uh, at, at least we uh, we know internally that we we did have this idea before we saw this paper. And uh, interestingly, the sample sizes that she predicted are even about right to see this. So. She was saying that, you know, if, if you want to see clones early in infection, the challenge is that you see a lot of just other noise from the ongoing replication. Again, no antiretroviral therapy at this point. So the, the virus is still replicating and you see a lot of actual just singles at that point. You don't necessarily see clones and you have to sample pretty deeply to even start to see the clones. Uh, if you look at their sample sizes, they found maybe nine clones in 700. And then in the low hundreds, they, they sometimes only found one or two clones. So this is in keeping with, with the, the modeling result. Okay, so summary so far here, uh, reservoirs created by a mixture of early seeding and cellular prol proliferation. Um, early ART can block this and even the earlier is better. The sequences that make up the reservoir appear to be replaced in some way, not mechanistically defined yet, but more rapidly before initiation of ART. So the, the reservoir is sort of more stable afterwards. Um, and the reservoir is hard to define for about a year following initiation of, of ART. So you, as an experimental uh, decision maker, you need to keep, keep in mind this washout period. And then the cellular proliferation of the ART could be driven by the cells into which HIV is integrated. So depending what that T cell is specific for, if it's specific for a common antigen, maybe it expands a lot and carries a lot of uh, HIV along with it. Okay, so this, this now links me back to, to say, now I can step onto this path and, and I wanna make a model that can simultaneously fit to these population dynamics and phylodynamics during primary infection so that we can sort of fully describe this process and get to what, what is the reservoir right at the beginning and then how does it change over time? Uh, so a phylodynamic model like this is, uh, is not a, a new idea. We're not the first to try this. And please do share if you, if you have favorite references here. I, I've compiled a, a, a pretty comprehensive list. This is part of it and uh, has a lot of, of great scientists on this list going back to the early 90s and, and all the way through, I think um, uh, Elena Georgi and, um, and yeah, the groups of, of Betty Corber and Alan Perlson as a continuation of this uh, Lee paper, I, th I think is the closest uh, match to what the way I've been thinking about it. And, and so these papers were, were looking at dynamics and evolution simultaneously. And, and they also have considered recombination in some of that. Uh, so I, I do think now we've put together the most uh, data sort of rigorous version of this to really try to match to a lot of the dynamics at the same time. And so I'll take you through this. I hope I can put this preprint up actually in the next, uh, I would say a few days, but of course everything gets delayed. Uh, so this is the viral load data that we've been using to fit to. So this is the sort of population dynamic study that I, I showed before. It's called the RV217 study. Uh, so it has great individual viral load curves over time. And then I, I've looked at summary statistics that I'll try to fit to. So I've, I've looked at 
what is the height of the viral load peak? When does the peak happen? What is the height of the viral load uh, nadir? So sort of following peak. And then what is the viral load set point? Also, what is the variability within an individual? I wanted to sort of get the stochasticity of, of the dynamics correct. So here, if you look over the, the longer term individuals who are followed up, how much does, uh, does someone's uh, line vary over time? That's sort of graphed here. I call this the set point variability and I only using people who have enough uh, time points to really make this real, but it seems like the viral load varies like about a log, though some people have a smaller size than that. And then we go to a different study that describes HIV evolution. So now summary statistics are the diversity of sequences. So this is the, the nucleotide diversity. So looking at how different the sequences are from one another on a pairwise level and sort of quantifying this at two different time points, an early one and a late one. And the, the divergence, so this is now, if you sort of estimate what the founder virus is, how many base pairs are the sequences different from that over time? So pretty, cl pretty close to the founder virus in the first week, and then slowly diverging, as I showed you, to, to, uh, to go away from that over time. And then finally, we wanted to get this reservoir size and composition, composition less important for this talk, but we're interested in intact sequences and total sequences because data are, are often collected for this and the, uh, there is a lot of mutation that leads to defective sequences. So we take all these summary statistics and this is the, the data that we're gonna try to fit to with, with this model. We begin with a, an ODE model for the population dynamics and then sort of slap on the, the evolutionary dynamics. So this is a model for which there are susceptible cells, classic HIV viral dynamics. They make infected cells, the infected cells make viruses, the viruses are cleared. The infected cells are killed really fast um, compared to natural T cells, which is why you get a big depletion in them. They can make latently infected cells. The latently infected cells can also reactivate and then there's some adaptive immunity that kills infected cells as well. So those are the sort of state variables of the model. And then we just say that each free virus has a genotype and then we're gonna allow the genotype to, to mutate. So I just think of this as like a never ending set of differential equations, which grows whenever a new genotype is added. Um, and I'll talk you through several parts of this. So the, the mutation model here is important as well so this is invoked every time a new cell is infected. So there's infected cell with this genotype, it makes some new virions, the virions infect a new cell. And there's three things that can happen here that can either be right away a totally non-viable sequence. So this is what I mentioned about these defective sequences. This happens uh, all the time with HIV. If that doesn't happen, then you can have a uh, intact HIV sequence and it can mutate or not. So it's, it's pretty likely by chance that it'll get some point mutation. It's also theoretically possible it gets no mutations. We go through and tested a bunch of models for what that means every time there's a mutation for the fitness of the virus. So the first thing is that maybe there's no, uh, no fitness change. So every time you get a new sequence, it has exactly the same fitness as its parent, simplest model. Second, slightly more complicated model is that every time you get a new viral sequence, it has a uniform probability of fitness. So you just draw it uh, randomly. And then the next two are, are various ways to sort of capture inheritance. So now this says from the parental sequence, if there's a mutation, it's, uh, it can have an average of, of about uh, staying the same as its parent, but it can get worse or it can get better. Same with a, with a normal distribution. So four models of, of what I would call intrinsic viral fitness. And, and it, it's clear that viruses do have different replicative capacities. So uh, this, this is worth considering. And then the other side of this model is the adaptive immune system. So uh, I'm running a little short on time here. So I'll, I'll go a little quickly through this, but the, the point is that there are two bi big categories that you could think of to to do this. One would be a, a more, a less mechanistic version where there's some sort of implicit immunity where maybe depending how many uh, infected cells there are of a certain genotype, they get killed more. Like the immune system recognizes 
the, the bigger uh, genotypes. Another option would just be to invoke a, an age structured model here too as well, where the strains that have been around longer are more likely to be killed. And then you can also add an explicit immune compartment. So this is add a new state variable that describes the adaptive immune system. And then we, we chose three possibilities for this. Either there's an adaptive immune system that, that can kill any genotype, so a globally uh, active immune system, or maybe you need a, a sort of strain specific immune system where every time there's a new viral genotype, you need a new adaptive immune system genotype to kill it or some mix of that with groups. And so, okay, this comes down to four fitness models, six uh, adaptive immunity models. Uh, we tried a bunch of parameter sets each, and then because it's a stochastic simulation, have to do replicates each. So this ends up with a lot of simulations in this big sort of model selection exercise, uh, which brings me to more acknowledgements with uh, Dave Swan here, who uh, sort of made this happen computationally. So I'm really grateful for his work on that. And cutting to the chase, interestingly, the, the best model in terms of sort of balancing accuracy against all the metrics uh, is the exponential fitness model. So only one free parameter compared to the normal distribution. I think that's no surprise that ends up winning and that inheritance is needed. Uh, but what was more surprising to us is that this global adaptive immunity model was the best one. And this immediately put in our head that, is it possible that you don't really need uh, some sort of selective pressure from the immune system to get these summary statistics to work out? Just to show you the fits here, the, the, the dots are the data in all of these panels, and then you have viral load, diversity, divergence, and reservoir size. And then the, the simulation replicates from the best model are the, the red lines. So it's it's a little bit overestimating viral load set point. There's, you know, there's a lot of, anytime you make a model like this, there's things you can fine tune. Um, but I think it does a pretty nice job getting all of these simultaneously. I, I think, an, yeah, another open question for me is, is why the diversity is fluctuating so much in the model. It's now implemented as a, uh, a big simulation that can sort of be, uh, simplified as much as possible to do it as quickly as possible, but is amenable to uh, a lot of different extensions, including if you want extra anatomic compartments, um, broadly neutralizing antibody therapy is, is something we're really interested in thinking about with a model like this. Of course, answer to our therapy and, and yeah, the, the simplest baseline model. Uh, to show you an example simulation of what this looks like, the, the black line here is the total and then each of the strains is simulated as one of these lines and the lines are colored by their genotype. And, and the key here is that the genotypes start red and then become a little more green, a little more yellow and, and get this ongoing divergence through the blues uh, as the total is able to stay constant. I can, uh, just for fun too, you can, you can watch a movie of this, which is really fun watching the new genotypes emerge and, and the, the colors sort of shift over time. So this is now just looking at each of the strain viral loads. A key thing that, that we're seeing too is, is, is in learning about is what's the extent that this founder virus sticks around. It does seem to predominate in most simulations for at least the first uh, few weeks to, to months before it's ultimately overtaken by the, the new sequences that are emerging. You can also, of course, compare the ecology of these strains over time. So not on a sequence level, but on a sort of rank abundance level. And this is what I'd be getting to, to start thinking about the reservoir. So you can see in this simulation, as I said, this, this big blue chunk here, if you look at the fraction of the strains in, in simulation time, this is this founder virus and it takes up 50% at least of the, the sequence space for the first uh, 40 days or so. And this is, you can see here, that's accompanied by this peak, this nadir and only at set point is there, is there room for um, new cells to emerge and new fit variants to, to come to, to light? A key point here, and I think this is, a, this is important for people who care about computational stuff, is that we're not tracking the whole bit string sequence. Uh, so in this forward simulation, so all we do is we, we keep around that number and then we keep the, the complete transmission record of the sequences. So you can sort of rebuild sequences later, but for, for uh, 
computational ability, it, it really helps to just track the number of, of, of mutations. The last thing I'll show here is just that from those sequences that you can recreate post facto, you can compare to simulated uh, and, and data clinic uh, phylogenetic trees. So this one here is a uh, human phylogenetic tree, really well sampled early HIV infection. Uh, and then this is our mo a model reconstructed tree that uh, is, is sort of getting a lot of the, the basic behaviors I wanna see, including that there really are times in HIV infection where there's co-circulating lineages so that you know, in, in the 100 days, there, there, there can be multiple fit variants that are around. The simulation of a course of infection, I think, is, is really where I'm going next with this. So I just wanted to show this for fun. But now this is simulating a primary infection. So the black line, again, is the total. The, the rainbow colors are the, the various strains. And so this is a simulation where we did about a year of primary infection started ART, so then the viral load can go away. You still see viral load blips, which is important because that's something that's observed clinically. So even while there's uh, mostly suppressed viremia, latent cells can reactivate and, and cause a little bit of virus. Importantly, also the that comes from different colors. So that's something that's been observed. It's not uh, necessarily any one sequence type that's gonna reactivate the, the reservoir sort of archiving the whole diversity. And then stopping ART here, the reservoir rebounds, uh, unfortunately, you know, as happens in humans. And it's often rebounding from the most recent variants. That's another thing I told you about. And then uh, evolution begins again. So that's, that's the sort of final fun figure here. And um, I'll, I'll do the summary and then, and then take any questions. So the, 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 the data validated model matches uh, a bunch of the the modeling and experimental results I've talked about in this. Um, the clones are created early and they're already made by proliferation. Uh, the reservoir cells are more likely to be related to sequences circulating near the time of ART initiation. I didn't show you that in the model, but, um, but that, that comes from that second part. And I'm, I'm excited about this as a platform for, for cure studies and endpoint discovery in, in the next round of modeling. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dan. That's a beautiful talk, I think, merging kind of the, the dominant quantitative approaches in HIV and, and, and virus modeling. So um, um, it's very exciting to see. Do we have um, any questions? I know I have some, but I, I thought maybe somebody might. Oh, we have a question in the chat. <laughs> Um, I'll read it from Faye because I'm guessing she wants me to read it. So power laws and self-similarity are associated with fractal systems and can indicate flexibility and robustness of these systems. How, are these power, how do these power laws translate heuristically in terms of HIV dynamics? Thanks, that's so awesome question. Um, and I could, I could actually suggest uh, if you ever wanna go look, Melanie Moses, uh, who's at uh, Los Alamos and New Mexico, has some beautiful papers on the spatial structure of the immune system compartments and how that might lead to power laws. So that's, she gives awesome talks on that. But um, for me, I think I would, uh, I would say the key to the HIV power laws, in my opinion, is that they arise because they're infecting the human T cells that already sort of obey these power law dynamics. And with that latency that seems to just be a passenger on the T cell dynamics, you eventually get that power law in HIV clones as well. So that's, I'm using in, in fact HIV in this way to sort of make claims about how the immune system's working, which is a fun development for me, kind of digging into immunology more. Um, great, uh, Alan Pearlson has uh, multiple questions. So I'll let him go. Yes. Hi, Dan. Very nice uh, talk. So uh, really some comments uh, also about the big stochastic model. Uh, first, it's, it went by fast, but it seemed to me that you don't have any antibody responses in there. And I'm sure, as you know, there's very early uh, autologous antibody responses coming up and you know, the whole business on uh, looking at sequences, both of the antibodies and how the virus evolves. Uh, Try and understand the generation of broadly neutralizing antibodies. There's a lot of data uh, like that. So I, I think the antibodies are also putting pressure 
on the virus and uh, especially for uh, mutations in the in envelope. Uh, also, I noticed you said, you know, in your simulations that you don't see any real diversification till day 40 or later, I forget, 60. Uh, again, if you look at the data coming from the early Chavi studies, where um, Andrew McMichael has been, been sequencing and looking at T early T cell responses, there's data that there's changes, you can have 100% change in the viral sequences in T cell epitopes. Uh, right after the viral peak. And I can, if you send me an email on some of these old old papers, but you can have very, very fast evolution, at least in T cell epitopes. Um, that's been tracked in some of the Chavi patients. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Um, so that's right. I I usually just, um, this is this is imprecise language. I usually, just say adaptive immunity. And I should, of course, be clear that that could include CD8s and antibodies. So for the first point, I, I think an interesting thing, which, so I didn't, I didn't talk as much about science here, and I'd, I'd love to talk more, I guess, about um, some of the findings, because I, I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't, but if you look at some of these metrics that, that show selection over time, they're, they're happening later. So, you know, a lot of the studies, it seems like are, are showing chronic infection. Um, for example, that people who are uh, HLA matched as opposed to not happen to have, uh, seem to have a lot more escape mutations, but that's also a later thing. If you look at the, the ratio of the non-synonymous to synonymous mutations, this is a really nice way to think about, is there a selective pressure? because the ones that are non-synonymous, meaning the protein actually changes, I'm saying this for everyone else, uh, are selected for more. Again, there's this nice paper from uh, Fabio Zanini and Richard Nair's group, uh, but that, that ratio doesn't really get that big until years of infection as well. So I think, um, I think your point about the Chavi thing is, is real. So I need to go look at that. And, and also I need to make sure that the simulations are amenable to early switches. Like, you know, it, I think there's an artifact somewhat in this, in this system here, which is that to, for com computational reasons, we often make the founder virus fit so that you don't lead to a ton of burnouts. But if, if you don't do that, it may be possible that there's a really fast switch in the dynamics and the non-founder virus takes over really quickly as well. So yeah, I, I think I you know, when you're looking, you just you know, when, when you're looking at the DMDS ratios and things, you, you tend to be looking over you know large pieces of sequence. Uh, in the data that I'm telling you about, they're looking very closely at particular T cell epitopes, looking at hot spots where there could be sequences, you know, uh, ten amino acids, which is changing very very rapidly, while the rest of the sequence is uh, not varying very much at all. So it depends on how you do the statistics on it. And this is run by George Shaw's uh, single genome amplification sequencing. But we, we can discuss that offline or I'll send you some things. But also you know, in your cartoon for the model, uh, it didn't look like you had the immune system directly doing anything against the virus. It looked like it was all against infected cells, which is why I was assuming you're not doing an antibody response. Yeah, that's right. So that. That, that would be another fun thing to talk about actually is, is what that changes in the dynamics if you, yeah, if you map the, the sort of emerging pressure onto the free virions instead. And then one, just one last comment on fitness functions. I'm, I'm, I don't know if you know of the work of Arup Chakraborty, but he's tried to develop uh, fitness landscapes based on looking at you know, large scale data on you know, point mutations and uh, double mutations and building and fitness landscape models you might want to try in addition to the stylized ones if you're, you're looking yeah at. thank thank you that actually that's something that came up to me just the, just recently as well and i should have done that a while ago I, something i also didn't show in this talk is that data we've compared to is from deep mutational scanning so i, I i'm sure you've seen this data too which is in vitro experiments on sort of competitive fitness again, I'm telling, this is for anybody else who's listening, where they grow out a bunch of viruses after mutating basically the library of amino acids. And what's kind of amazing is that 
that distribution is not that different from an exponential distribution, the, the distribution that we find. So I, I try to make the claim as well that, uh, you know, in the paper here, that if the in vitro fitness landscape is pretty close to the one that best fits these summary statistics, right? So if you don't include some of these T cell epitope fine grain things, you can describe a lot of the HIV evolution early on with a fitness function that is basically the same as the intrinsic viral fitness distribution, which, which shows a little bit that the selective pressure, if it's happening, may, you know, or I guess we know that there's selection in HIV, but is it, uh, is it possible that it's a little bit more of a red herring than, uh, than a lot of people have been, been thinking about? That's, that's sort of the controversial question I would ask. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think it depends on the scale that you're looking at. So anyway, just some comments to help you. Yeah, thanks so much, Alan. Right, well, Good to see you. Likewise. <laughs> Good morning, baby, and, and the sheesh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks, Alan. Are, are there any other questions from... Uh, um, oh, sorry, there is a question. Uh, what type of cells are the, the clones? They're infected T cells. What is the composition of the reservoir? Are we, are we thinking of only infected T cells? Yeah, great question. So the every everything I talked about here is infected T cells. I think there is there is an angle of the field that's interested about more uh, HIV infection in, in more uh, interesting immune cells, macrophages, um, stuff that happens in the brain. So there's these kind of angles that I haven't gotten to yet, but um, that is a little bit of me just staying mainstream with HIV research as a modeler, uh, not trying to get too um, deep into biology. I don't understand, but um, but I, I hope that answers your question. Perfect. Well, we're a bit. Uh, um, if there is any last questions, um, please feel free. But um, we're a bit over time, so which is totally fine. We can stay as long as people want to stay. Um, and if not, uh, thanks again, Dan, for your, your great talk and um, happy holidays, everyone. We'll, we're starting back um, in January, the first week of January, I believe, um, with uh, Mamadou Yauk, who's at McGill, and he works on um, statistical models for tracking HIV more in epidemics, if I'm, I hope I didn't misstate what he does. So um, I will send an announcement with that, and I hope you all have a safe and happy rest of your month. Nice to see you. Thanks, Morgan. Great for organizing this. Yeah, I'm glad to see you, everyone. Or yeah, month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.